So, uh, thank you for attending the last session of the day. And this is almost the last session of this uh, meeting. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, introduce, sorry, oops. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, uh, long-time colleagues, uh, Fred Dover and Derek Hockenberger that I know, and, and new colleague now, uh, Rick Enig. Uh, the three of them are from uh, Entanglement uh, Incorporation. So we are going to put a link on the LinkedIn uh, pictures and, and so you can have a look of, of what uh, the company is doing. And uh, today I'm very happy to, to say that they are going to talk about uh, quantum bridge analytics and binary optimization, which is the heart of the topic for uh, this presentation. So guys, you have the floor. Very good. Okay, let's progress to the next slide. It's, first, I want to say it's a great pleasure to be here and take part in this conference. The Euro Working Group on Metaheuristics is a vibrant force in the world of metaheuristic optimization. And I suppose you all know it has the impressive feat of uniting over 1,400 members for over 80 countries. As I begin this introduction to our presentation, let me say that our presentation may be viewed as a natural complement of the outstanding presentation by Jin Kaohao on Tuesday. Our focus today is on a special perspective we call quantum bridge analytics, which links ideas and optimization to developments in quantum computing. To start, we go back to first principles and introduce basic notions in a tutorial fashion. Then we will cover computational experience, comparing our findings to leading approaches. I think you'll be astonished when you see the kinds of results that are possible. So let me begin. In a nutshell, quantum bridge analytics is devoted to developing tools for bridging classical and quantum computing. The goal here is to seek the benefits there of all of their alliance in the present and to produce enhanced practical application of quantum computing in the future. Next slide. The Cubo model is at the center of these developments. This is the model that Jin Cao talked about. Uh, and this is due to its relevance uh, and its equivalence to the Ising model and a well-known ability to serve as a unified framework for combinatorial optimization. And so, as the slide says, the Cubo model is quantum ready. Next slide. So we'll be discussing about the Cubo model, what it is, how it's constructed, how it's been used to address various problems. And as I mentioned, we'll be presenting computational experience. Next slide. There's a wide range of applications a uh, wide, wide range of organizations and research groups that are actively engaged in applications. Here's just a few of them. Google, Amazon, IBM, Lockheed Martin, Los Alamos National Laboratory, which by the way, we're associated with, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the NASA Ames Research Center, and many others. Next slide. I'll just give you a quick overview of some of the applications that stand out for their importance. Financial services, transportation, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, materials and life sciences, energy and utilities, and numerous others. Next slide. And to list some applications in combinatorial optimization, 
And again, these are just a few. I'll just mention uh, some of them. Graph coloring, I'm sure you're aware of this. Capital budgeting, warehouse location and product distribution, multiple knapsack problems, maximum indecent, independent set problems, and the list goes on. Now, with this background, I'll turn this over to Gary Kokenberger, who will provide details of modeling. And then our presentation will conclude with Rick Hennig, who will tell you about the computational outcomes we are achieving. Gary? Thanks, Fred. Uh, Rick, you want to advance at one? The Kubo model, this very special model that Fred mentioned and that Jin Kay was talking about earlier in the conference, can simply be described as optimize X transpose QX, where X is a vector of binary decision variables and Q is a symmetric N by N matrix of constant. Um, please go ahead, Rick. Yeah. This model has proven to be amazingly versatile in its ability to represent a wide variety of combinatorial problems. And it serves in that capacity as an alternative to traditional approaches to combinatorial optimization. Fred and Rick and I have had an interest in this model for many, many years. And more recently, the, the broadly defined quantum community has gotten really interested in the Kubel uh, model as well. Uh, and it's been heavily looked at, researched by such diverse computing uh, platforms as quantum annealing, the gate-based uh, approaches, Fujitsu, uh, optimal fiber, and several other approaches. So this is widely uh, of wide interest today to many, many people in the optimization community and the quantum computing community, as I'm sure the audience knows, okay? As Fred mentioned, part of our motivation uh, is derived from the ability of this model to represent uh, this wide variety of combinatorial problems. Uh, and the way it goes about that is to reformulate a traditionally formulated problem uh, as this unconstrained quadratic model. And we're gonna give you several explicit examples of that in, in, a, in a couple of moments. But before we get into the explicit examples, uh, I, I just want to comment that uh, common practice in combinatorial optimization often includes uh, an analyst uh, designing a special purpose solution technique that takes advantage of the special purpose that a given a model, a given application might have. And over time, these specially designed algorithms have proven to be very effective. Uh, the flip side of it is that often these special purpose methods apply just to the mathematical structure, the special structure that was being exploited, and they don't apply to other problems. Uh, in contrast to that, the Cuba model is a single model uh, that can represent a wide variety of applications. And then as such, rather than having many models and many solution techniques, with Cubo, we have one model and one solution technique. And that technique, of course, is a solver that will optimize the Cubo model. We've been working on that for many years, and we're going to present some pretty impressive computational experience later on. Okay, Rick. The basic idea in transforming a traditionally formulated problem into a cubo involves uh, using uh, quadratic penalties in place of the constraints that are found in a traditional model, and then including these penalties in the original objective function to produce an augmented function that takes the form of a quadratic function in binary variables. That is to say, it takes the form of a cubo model. In principle, any polynomial model in binary variables can be recast into the form of a cubo model. Most often, the problems we work on uh, start out to be linear or quadratic models in binary variables with linear constraints. This is the typical traditional model that we recast into the form of a, of a cubo model. 
by taking those linear constraints, representing them alternatively as quadratic penalties, and producing a, a cubo model that we then optimize. Okay, right. Now, in creating these cubo models, um, we're going to give you several explicit uh, examples uh, in the next few slides. But let me comment that there are some really important problems that are naturally cubos that don't need to be reformulated. And the most prominent of those would be the max cut problem. And we're going to go over a little example of that in a moment. And, and in fact, later in the presentation, Rick's going to show some computational experience for some very special forms of max cut problems. Um, most applications that we uh, that we look at though have traditionally in their traditional formulation have constraints and we must discover or, or use known penalties to represent those constraints in this alternative way that shows up in the cubo model. Now, for some very important and widely encountered uh, constraints on the traditional side, uh, we already know uh, penalties. That is to say, there are some known penalties for commonly encountered constraints. And when you have a problem uh, that has these types of constraints uh, within it, you can simply uh, use the known penalties straight away. Uh, and we're going to give you some examples of those known uh, penalties in a moment. But in the most general case of all, we will not know the penalties a priori, and we'll have to construct the quadratic penalty uh, in a more general sense. And it turns out that's pretty easy to do, and we'll give you some examples of that as well. It's also possible in very special applications to uh, discover special penalties. And we've done some work on that, uh, the most prominent example of that is for the linear ordering problem, um, but that's for another talk, okay? So let's consider uh, our first example of a cubo model here. And this is one that where I mentioned earlier that the max cut problem is naturally a cubo. So let's see how that is the case. So I know everyone in the audience is, is familiar with max cut. We have this uh, undirected uh, graph and the max cut problem uh, seeks to partition the vertex set into two sets such that the number of edges between the two sets is as large as possible. Now, the way to model this is to introduce a binary variable, let's say xj, and define it to be one if the vertex j is in one set and xj is equal to zero if it's in the other set. Now, given this definition, if you consider this, this uh, expression, xi plus xj minus 2xi xj, if you look at that expression for a moment, uh, if xi and xj have the same value, that is to say they're both 0 or both 1, then this expression evaluates to 0, um, meaning that, that, that the, those vertices i and j are in the same set. If xi and xj have different values, though, then this quantity evaluates to one, indicating that the edge ij is in the cut. That is to say, nodes i and j are in different sets. Given that, we can uh, formulate the max cut problem as the optimization problem as depicted here. We simply want to maximize the sum over all edges in the graph, that, that particular quantity we mentioned. And notice that that is a quadratic uh, equation, which means it's an instant of the cubo problem, uh, maximize y equal x transpose uh, qx. So it's really easy to model the max cut problem as a cubo, as an instant instance of the cubo model. Let's look at a little example of that. So here we have a little graph uh, with, with five nodes and six edges. Um, so for each edge, uh, we have this quantity xi plus xj minus 2xi x, xj. We simply add all those together as depicted there and clean up the algebra to get the following. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, to get this in the form of uh, that we're more accustomed to with cubo, that is to say, maximize x transpose qx where the Q matrix is given as shown there. Uh, 
So all the problem data shows up in the in the Q matrix. This is obviously a little toy example, easy to solve. Uh, and if you do solve this, you find that the solution as depicted there, vertices two and three are in one set, vertices one, four, and five uh, in the other, and the max cut value is five. As I mentioned earlier, Rick, later on in the presentation, is going to show you a lot of computational experience with some special max cut problems. Okay. Well, as we mentioned, most problems that you're interested in solving are modeled in a traditional manner with a variety of constraints. Uh, and uh, for some very special types of constraints, and I'll give you a list of those in a moment, um, we have uh, penalties that are already known to us. Now, more generally, we say a penalty function is a valid and feasible penalty, a VIP, if it is zero for feasible solutions and if it is otherwise positive. So including these VIPs in the objective function, that is to say, adding them to the original objective function, uh, a given model can be transformed into the form of a cubo. Now, for some very special uh, constraints, as I mentioned, we already know what pen, what's a, a, a VIP to use. So let's look at some of those on the next slide. Okay. If you look at this slide, uh, there's really two main columns here. <clears throat> on the left, we have what we're calling classical constraints. And on the right, there are equivalent penalties that we could use to construct the cubo. So if you look at the very first example there, and by the way, all the variables in this slide are binary variables. So X and Y are binaries, okay? So if you look at the very first classical constraint, X plus Y less than or equal to one, what that constraint is really saying is that not both X and Y can be one. They could both be zero, one or the other could be one, but that constraint explicitly precludes both X and Y from being one. Now, by the way, that constraint shows up, that type of constraint uh, shows up in many, many important applications, and we'll illustrate some of those later on in the talk. Um, if you move over to the right-hand column corresponding to this constraint, we see the penalty P times the product XY. So uh, P is just a, a sc positive scalar. Uh, it's uh, It'll appear in many, many of our applications. Obviously, x, y, that product's just a simple quadratic uh, function. If you So if you go back on the left-hand side and remind yourself that feasible solutions um, preclude both x and y from being one, if you look at the penalty on the right-hand side, uh, if x and y are both one, then that penalty is equal to p. If p is a positive scalar, that would uh, add something to the objective function. The idea being then, as we construct our cubal model by adding these penalties to the original objective function, the optimization that ensues will try to force these uh, variables in the feasible direction um, and so forth. This first penalty, x plus y less than or equal to one, is so prominent in so many applications that we've singled it out for a special designation. We call that transformation number two. Uh, transformation number one will, will be defined in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Notice that on the left-hand side, we have a variety of other constraints. They all show up in lots of applications. And on the right-hand side, we have the corresponding uh, VIP uh, quadratic penalty that can be used as an alternative to the constraint on the left, okay? Let's see how we might use this. So let's take a look at the minimum vertex cover problem. This is a prominent problem that uh, many of you have looked at over the years. A vertex cover involves uh, finding a subset of the vertices such that each edge in the, in the graph is incident to at least one vertex in the subset. And the minimum vertex cover problem seeks to find a cover with the minimum number of vertices in the subset. So we can model that as, as follows. We can, we can define x of j to be one if vertex j is in the cover, that is to say, if it's in the subset, uh, 
and otherwise xj is equal to zero. And given that the standard traditional uh, formulation of this model uh, appears as the following, we want to minimize the sum of the xj's, that is to say, they, we want to minimize the number of nodes that are in, 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 the, in the subset, subject to these constraints. Now, I want to apologize. I, I, have, I have an error in the constraints. It should say xi plus xj greater than or equal to one. Uh, so for each uh, edge in the graph um, uh, with, with n's endpoint nodes, uh, xi and xj, we have a constraint of this nature, xi plus xj greater than or equal to one. Now you can imagine that even for a modest sized graph, there are many, many of these constraints because the number of edges is extremely large as graphs get more and more dense. There can be thousands and thousands of these constraints in a minimum vertex cover problem. And yet when we construct the equivalent cubo model, we'll have exactly the same decision variables and we'll have a quadratic model with absolutely no constraints other than, other than the binary constraints. Um, so if you look at the mathematical structure of our constraints here, and if you look back at our uh, at our list, we'll see that this is one of the commonly encountered constraints that's on our list. We already know what the quadratic uh, feasible uh, penalty is uh, that we can use. So Rick, if you'll advance. Okay. Uh, again, uh, rever referring to our penalty, uh, list of penalties, we see that for this type of constraint, xi plus xj greater than or equal to one, a penalty of the form as is shown there, P times the quantity one minus X minus Y plus the quadratic term uh, can be used to immediately recast our traditionally formulated model as a cubo. So as we indicate there, if you notice that we have Y uh, minimize Y equal uh, to the sum of the X's, that's the original objective function. Notice we just depend to that, these quadratic penalty terms. And once again, we have uh, straight away uh, an instance of the famous Cubo model. Notice that when you clean up the algebra here, you're going to get an additive constant. Um, so when you write this in the form of X transpose QX, you also pick up an additive constant term. Of course, we ignore that. Uh, as far as the optimization goes, and then we can bring it into the picture later on, uh, or we can simply take the values of X that come out of optimizing uh, X transpose QX and evaluate the objective function with that solution. Let's look at an example. Okay. So here we have again, a graph with, uh, with our five nodes and so forth and six edges. Uh, Given that penalty that we just discovered on the previous couple of slides, we can immediately write down the cubal model. So we've done it there. We have the original objective function. Uh, now notice that since we're minimizing the original objective function, we add the quadratic penalty terms to the, to the original objective function. In other applications where we're maximizing, of course, we would be subtracting the quadratic penalties from the objective function. So at the bottom of the slide here, we indicate that we simply um, combine terms and notice that the, the very last term uh, on the second line there at 6p, that's the additive constant that I spoke of earlier. So when we go about minimizing this function, we can just ignore 6p for the time being. Okay, Rick. So cleaning up the algebra there, we find that our, our cubal model is X transpose QX, where this is what the Q matrix looks like. Um, in constructing this Q matrix, I automatically use the value of eight for the scalar uh, constant P. Uh, again, this is a very small example of a cubo. It's easy to solve and you get the solution that's depicted at the bottom of the slide there. Okay, Rick. Another really uh, widely known and important problem is called the Max2Sat problem. Um, in this 
particular application, we have a, a bunch of liter a bunch of clauses, each consisting of two literals in conjunctive normal form. Um, and we want to, the idea is to find out uh, assignments for the literals that would satisfy the maximum number of clauses. And one way to model this is to recognize that there are three possibilities for these clauses, each of which contains exactly two literals. And one possibility is that there are no negations in the clause. An example is Xi uh, plus uh, Xj. Uh, Xi or Xj. The traditional constraint for that is as shown there, uh, which is the same constraint we had in the previous application. And the quadratic penalty for that constraint is shown right below it. Another possibility is that we have one negation, um, and that would be um, uh, Xi or uh, Xj bar, the bar meaning the, the complement of Xj. And the uh, quadratic penalty for that is shown as given there. And the third possibility is that we have two negations. And again, that gives rise to a quadratic penalty as sh shown there as well. So the point is that for a max two set uh, problem, uh, there are three possibilities for the clauses. And we know uh, a priori, a quadratic penalty we can use for each of those possibilities. So to model a max two sat problem as a cubo, all you have to do is identify which of the three penalties uh, apply for a given clause, add them up, and you've got your cubo model. Um, we've used this approach for many, many uh, instances of max two sat, including some very large ones, and solved them very easily with our cubo solver. Yeah. Okay, Rick. Rick, go ahead. So that was a couple of examples of recasting traditionally formulated problems into the form of a cubo. And in those cases, we already knew what, uh, what uh, penalty we should be using or we could be using. But what do we do in a more general case where we don't have something on, the, uh, on our list of known penalties? Well, it turns out it's pretty easy just to construct the quadratic penalties straight away provided that we start out uh, with a, a general model in the form as depicted here. So notice here that our, uh, in this general form, we want to minimize uh, uh, Cx. Uh, C and X are both vectors here. Uh, so that's a linear equation subject to a system of linear uh, equations, Ax equal B. Uh, so the idea is to take these constraints, Ax equal B, uh, put them up into the objective function in, 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 in a quadratic form. By, by that, I mean uh, construct from Ax equal to B a set of quadratic uh, penalties. Um, so we, as, as depicted on the bottom half of this slide, if you clean up the algebra, you get that it's simply X transpose QX plus E, where E here is the additive constant we've spoken of earlier. So Rick, if you go one more. So dropping the additive constant, uh, the equivalent unconstrained version of our original problem uh, is given by simply X transpose QX. This is what we refer to as transformation number one. This is the approach we take on many, many applications. Um, and it's it's easy to, to implement and it works um, provided that you first produce your constraints in the form of AX equal B. And we'll talk more about that a little later in the presentation. Okay, Rick. So here's a, a prominent example of this more general uh, problem that you might run into and how we can convert that into a cubal model. So this is a set partitioning problem, um, a very important problem in combinatorial optimization, minimize uh, the sum of CJ, XJ, subject to a system of M constraints of the form, uh, sum AIJ, XJ equal one, where these the AIJs are just zero one parameters denoting whether or not a given variable is in a given uh, given constraint. Uh, 
Notice that this mathematical formulation, this is the, the traditional approach to set partitioning, is in the form of the general model we had on the previous couple of slides. Um, and, and what that means is that we can immediately transform this, recast this model into a Cuba model by applying transformation number one. We've done a lot of testing uh, on this model and Rick's gonna give some results for, for the set partitioning problem later on in the talk, but it's, it's easy to do transformation number one, convert this into a cubo, and then have this alternative representation of a set partitioning problem and an, and an alternative way of solving the set partitioning problem. Okay, Rick. Another example, in fact, and this is one Fred mentioned earlier in the talk as well, is the graph coloring problem. Um, and in the uh, classical vertex coloring problem, we want to assign colors to nodes in the graph such that uh, each node gets a color and such that adjacent nodes receive different colors. Um, and this can be modeled as a satisfiability problem uh, as follows. We can define x sub i j to be one if node i, it should be node i, is assigned color j and equal to zero uh, otherwise. So we have these decision variables um, and we have two things to, to, to manage here. One is we have to make sure that each vertex in the graph gets a color. And then we have to make sure that adjacent vertices, if we're gonna have a, a feasible coloring, Adjacent vertices, in fact, have different colors. So our first concern uh, can be modeled as is depicted there. Uh oh, we have um, there we go. For each node in in the in the graph, uh, we must make sure that one one of the k colors. The idea here is that we want to see if we can find a feasible coloring uh, using k colors, cap k colors. You know. So for each node in, in the graph, we're going to have an equation that says one of the K colors must be assigned uh, to that particular node. And, and in order then to have a feasible coloring, we must make sure that adjacent uh, nodes have different colors. And notice that that can be modeled by uh, the very special constraint uh, that we referred to as being part of transformation number two constraints of the form uh, that we saw earlier, the form we saw was x plus y less than or equal to one. Well, those are the very constraints we have here to impose the adjacency con conditions that we want to impose. So the thing that's illustrated in this example of graph coloring is using transformation number one and transformation number two in concert to uh, recast a problem into the form of a cubo. We'll use transformation number one on our first set of constraints, the equations there uh, that assign a color to each node. And we'll use transformation number two on the adjacency uh, requirements uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, okay, Rick. So here's a little example uh, with, with five nodes. And the idea here is that we'd like to assign uh, we have three colors to use. We want to assign colors to nodes such that we have a feasible coloring. So since we have five nodes, we're going to have five equations, uh, one for each node. Um, each equation requires that one of the three colors will be assigned to that particular node. And then we have our adjacency concern constraints uh, as depicted down there at the bottom. We'll have uh, uh, we have a constraint like that uh, for each node, each each adjacent pair of nodes, and each color p. So that using transformation number one and transformation number two, we readily convert that into a cubal model as depicted on the next slide. So here we have a cube matrix of uh, fifteen. It's a fifteen by fifteen matrix. Uh, Again, this is a small cubo instance, uh, easily to solve. Uh, and the solution is as depicted there. Uh, just a quick note on that solution that's given. We've renumbered the uh, variables uh, consecutively there from one to 15. Um, 
to have our cubo model x transpose qx. Okay, Rick. Well, it's certainly the case that many important problems uh, take this form of this general uh, uh, traditional uh, representation we spoke of earlier, but in often, uh, often it, it, it happens that there's a mixture of constraint types. That is to say, some are inequalities, some are equations, and the form that we need for transformation number one, our most general approach for recasting, is that we have a set of equations, ax equal b. Well, this can always be arranged uh, by including slack variables uh, to convert inequalities into equations. We simply have to represent those slack variables as a binary expansion. But given that we do that, we can use transformation number one as we spoke of earlier. So let's take a look at a little example of that. So at the top of this slide, we have a, a, a general zero one programming problem in five binary variables and three constraints. And notice that the first and third constraints are inequalities. And we're gonna have to, as a uh, prerequisite step, prerequisite to using transformation number one, we're gonna have to convert the first and third constraint into equations by including slack variables. And to do that, you have to estimate the magnitude of the slack activity. So for variable number one, I'm gonna introduce, I have a slack activity I call S1, and I'm just estimating using my, uh, uh, my domain knowledge here uh, that S1 is gonna be between zero and three. And likewise, for the third constraint, I've got a slack variable I'm just gonna call S3. And I'm going to estimate that it's going to be between zero and six. And then you see for both of those cases, I have a binary expansion. In other words, slack, very, slack activity S1, I'm going to represent by one X6 plus two X7, where of course X6 and X7 are new binary variables. And likewise for S3, I've got a binary expansion for that slack activity. 1x8 plus 2x9 plus 4x10. Inserting those slack activities into the constraints, I now have my model, uh, traditionally formulated model, in the form I need of maximizing Cx subject to Ax equal b. So I can immediately use transformation number one to recast this problem as a Cubo instance. Since this is such a small problem, uh, I don't need, I can, I can represent transformation number one as shown at the bottom of the slide there. And Rick, if you'll advance now. Uh, cleaning up the algebra, you get a, a cubo model with the Q matrix as depicted here. Uh, and again, this Q matrix was constructed by uh, an arbitrary choice for the uh, scalar penalty P of 10, uh, solving this uh, model gives the solution as is depicted at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, notice that when you solve this cubo model, uh, which was uh, maximize X transpose QX, the, the optimal value for that cubo model was, is 916. Uh, remember when you do the recasting into the form of a cubo, uh, using the general methodology, you pick up an additive constant. And in this case, with P equal to 10, the additive constant is minus 900. So if you subtract the 900 from the 916, you get the desired uh, amount for the original objective function value of 16, which is the optimal solution to that problem. Okay, Rick. The... Examples we've given you so far have all started out with a linear objective function, uh, but uh, uh, the approach we, we've outlined here and uh, applies just as well if you start out with a quadratic objective function, um, or indeed, if you start out with a higher order objective function, you can, in principle, uh, reformulate that down to a quadratic um, function as well. So here's an example of what, what's called a quadratic knapsack problem. And it's typically uh, modeled as depicted here. We want to maximize uh, 
this quadratic objective function subject to say a budget constraint that would be our knapsack constraint and the decision variables here are depicted uh, as as follows let's define x of j to be one if alternative j perhaps a project that we're interested in is chosen otherwise xj is equal to zero so given a, a knapsack problem of this form, this quadratic knapsack problem, uh, all we have to do to convert this to a cubo is, is replicate what we did on the last example, and that is to say, convert this constraint into an equation and then use transformation number one. That's really easy to do. So let's look at the example on the next slide. Here's an explicit example of that, where we have a quadratic uh, objective function that we want to maximize subject to the knapsack constraint uh, as shown there, where we have a knapsack capacity of 16. So if we add slack variables as we've done in previous examples, we get the equation as is depicted there. Given that we can immediately construct our quadratic uh, function, our cubal model, as shown at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we can clean up the algebra. Go ahead, Rick. And we get our cubal model with the Q matrix as depicted there. Solving that gives the solution as is shown there in the slide. Adjusting for the additive constant, uh, we get the value 28 for the original objective function, which is the optimal solution uh, for this problem. Okay, Rick. Okay, well, I'm gonna hand it over to Rick in, in, in just a moment to talk about some computational experience, but let me just comment that the explicit examples we just went over were intended to show how we can accommodate a wide variety of traditionally formulated combinatorial problems uh, by recasting them into the form of a cubal problem and then solving them as an instance of the cubal model. This is an alternative way to the traditional methodology. Uh, and we've discovered in, in vis-a-vis -vis a wide variety of computational testing that this approach works very, very well. And Rick's going to uh, illustrate that with some results he wants to share with you now. Okay, Rick, thanks. Great, thank you, Gary. So after we've talked about how we build these Cubo models, we wanna talk a little bit about how we can go about solving them and a solver that we've developed over uh, with Fred and Gary and myself and others, um, something we're calling NGQ, Next Generation Cubo. And based on all the years of meta heuristic research that that we've been doing. We developed a highly parallel hybrid heuristic that utilizes a number of different techniques. We're not going to really go into detail on how NGQ works, but I'll mention it. It takes advantage of adaptive memory programming, scatter search and path relinking, uh, parallel evolutionary algorithms, mimetic methods. It's really kind of a uh, greatest hits list for meta heuristics, if you will. Um, it's highly optimized and scalable, solving over 300,000 fully connected variables over a million sparse variables. And we'll look at some computational results here for some really large problems today uh, to see how they compare. Um, there's four different problem classes that we spent some time researching. One is the set partitioning problem, as Gary mentioned earlier in the talk. Uh, the other is the maximum diversity problem. We'll also look at the max cut on what's called deregular graphs, random graphs of a particular width, and then uh, look at some non-convex cubos from the QP lib that's out there. So to illustrate the effectiveness of the Cuba model, we we did a study on very large set partitioning instances. Um, we consider a medium large and very large. And we'll get into what size these are. We did a study with CPLEX, D-Waves, uh, hybrid solver service, 
and our NGQ solver. Um, on the medium instances, and these are minimization problems, um, these are of 6,000 variables and 8,000 variables. Um, we are given a time limit on CPLEX for five hours, and it was able to actually prove the optimality with zero gap on these problems. And we see um, the time there is quite long, but it, it's a complete solver and not a heuristic. So that's a little different. D-Wave, um, we also gave um, a, a small limit too, but we were not able to find the uh, optimal answer um, in any of those cases with the D-Wave hybrid solver service. Uh, NGQ is able to find the same answers and actually improve on the answer from CPLEX uh, in a very, very modest time frame. We're talking about 19 seconds for eight thousand variables now this was ran on a uh relatively small machine with 32 cores um so not specialized hardware um but we do see very good results with our ngq solver um on larger problems we went over up to uh, 10,000 variables and up to 40,000 variables of different density and we also see that NGQ outperformed CPLEX, um, which in many cases came up with the correct answer, and D-Wave in this, these cases. Um, we'd like to investigate more with D-Wave and see if there's some additional parameters that can improve, but we saw some interesting results where um, the effect um, objective function value was not even within the range that we'd expect. So worth some further investigation. And then finally, um, some of the largest Kubo instances, we went to 50,000 to 100,000 variables and we're able to solve these with a better lower bound than uh, CPLEX in this case. Now. I would say CPLEX is probably not the greatest example for, for comparing against a heuristic method that really we should be comparing heuristic methods together, but it is interesting to see that uh, the comparison here in the time. Next, I wanna talk about the maximum diversity problem. And here we are recasting uh, once again, a very familiar looking formulation where we've got our objective function and um, using what I think, Gary, you refer to as uh, transformation number one, uh, are able to formulate this as a Kibo very readily. Um, we want to compare it with one of the best solvers out there, and that's something called the opposition-based memetic search. And that really is a uh, one of the best methods for solving the maximum diversity problems. Uh, and we tested on some of the largest instances from what's called the MDP Lib 2.0. And here we see that opposition-based memetic search uh, and NGQ both arrive at the exact same objective functions for here. And in some cases, in quite considerably less time than OBMA. This once again was ran on a 32 core machine. I'm not sure what OBMA was ran on. So once again, not quite a fair comparison, but we can see some of these instances, we, we get an answer in 3.7 seconds compared to like 335 seconds for OBMA. Next, I'd like to talk about deregular max cut. We really, uh, when we worked on our solver, we were important that we handle very large, uh, very sparse Cubo models. And we can solve up to a million variables, but unfortunately there's really not a lot of numerical benchmarks available for Cubos up to a million variables. So, uh, 
what we did is we looked at the max cut problem on random deregular graphs where every vertex is connected to exactly D uh, other vertices. And it's been shown that there's a theoretical cut upper bound that can be calculated um, based on a universal constant um, related to the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model of the Ising um, spin glass model. And so we're able to at least get an approximation ratio to measure our performance on graphs um, running up to 10 minutes on um, each of these, 10 runs of 10 minutes each. And here we see this approximation ratio that we're getting. We, we averaged about for D equals to three, we get a 97.2% approximation ratio all the way from 1,000 up to a million variables. And at D equals five, we get 98.5% approximation ratio. So we really see this as um, some outstanding results on these particularly um, interesting max cut problems that a lot of people are, are interested in solving. And, and we see this really promising for um, solving large sparse problems with the Cuba model. And lastly, I'll point out um, there's something called QP Live for quadratic programming library. And, and we chose non-convex quadratic binary problems from the QP Lab. And also once again, ran uh, this in case was ran on a laptop with a time limit of 60 seconds since they are smaller problems. Um, we actually found 20 out of the 23 matched the objective function from QP Lab. And in other cases, in three um, cases, we actually found improved solutions over what the, the best bounds from the QP Lab was. And this was all done on a laptop uh, in under 60 seconds, in many cases, in a fraction of a second. So that's what we've got for computational results. I guess in, in summary, Gary, do you want to give the summary or should I go ahead and go, go right ahead? Yeah, go right okay. ahead. Perfect. So, you know, in summary, the Cuba model with a suitable solver, and there's a lot of interest in different solvers right now, and I think we're we're really betting on um, what quantum computing is going to bring to the table. We, we're doing a lot of experimentation with quantum, quantum-inspired computers. And at the forefront of this is the Cuba model, which is capable of producing some of the best-known solutions uh, for many, many important problems. And it's really exciting to see the number of Cubo formulations every day that, that comes across uh, the wire. And given the current state of quantum and quantum inspired computers, we still see many heuristic algorithms are providing the best performance, sometimes by a wide margin. Um, but we are expecting as quantum computers continue to mature that they will give meta heuristics a run for their money. And as solvers, both conventional and quantum, continue to improve, uh, the success of the Cubo approach will continue to grow. And we look forward to continuing to see work on the, the Cubo and Cubo problem with different solvers and, uh, and hardware. And with that, anything you'd like to add, Fred or Gary, before we go to our Q&A session? No, I think that's that's fine, Rick. Let's let's move on to Q and A. Um, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you for this this very nice presentation, a three voice presentation. Uh, we have time for questions, so please. <coughs> The first one is the most difficult. So, yes, Eric Tayar. <laughs> I have uh, one question. Uh, when you have uh, several uh, constraints yeah, that uh, enters in the subjective function, 
normally you should have uh, several different uh, weights or penalties, but you choose only one. That was B, that was the scholar. Uh, is that uh, important to have uh, just one uh, scholar or can we choose uh, whatever uh, different? Uh, uh, is this uh, changing the computational uh, result if you uh, have uh, several uh, different uh, penalties? You want to cover that, Gary? Yeah, that's a really good question. Let me start out, and then Rick and Fred, you can add as as you see fit. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. You if, you know, generally on a on a complicated model, traditionally formulated. You might have different categories of constraints and you might, uh, one approach might be to have different penalties for the different categories of constraints. Um, although it, it's possible to uh, have a single penalty for all the constraints, we've experimented with both approaches uh, and, and uh, it's not clear to me at this point um, which approach is, is, is better. Um, in principle, one penalty will work if you start out with your system of equations, uh, AX equal B, one scalar will, will work, but um, but it, it, you're certainly, it's certainly fine to have different scalar penalties for different constraints. Um, and it can make a difference in, in the computational uh, burden. Rick, the, is that your experience? That Pretty much is. I, I typically find um, more complex problems will require um, to have multiple penalties and different weights, but a lot of times those can be in conflict with each other. And so it, it's um, we've done some research into how do you find the optimal value for those penalty weights? And that's a real challenge. There's a number of different approaches that you can take, but um, you can go either way. You can go with a single penalty or, or with multiple penalties. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. I have a question regarding computational results. When you present time, uh, how many runs did you do? And uh, is it a, an average time or is it for one run? It is an average time over uh, uh, 10 runs. For each uh, solver, for each computer, you did uh, 10 uh, runs and it is the average time, is it? Correct. Thank you. And could you- or, I'm sorry, it's the best best time. Not the best time over the 10 runs. Best time over the 10 runs. Okay. Ah, okay. And could you tell something more about the machines, the computers, MGQ? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, could you tell more so about uh, NGQ computer? What is, what is it? Oh, so NGQ is software. It's the meta heuristic algorithm. And we're just running it on commodity hardware. There's no special computer that we're using. Um, so just normal computer with 32 cores and and I don't know how much memory we had on that machine. I would have to look, but no specialized hardware for NGQ. And it's a classical optimization approach. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. So think about the solver, I have a question. So um, have you thought about having a materialistic model? So mixing the exact resolution like CPLEX and meta heuristic approach? We have thought of that and actually looking at um, using the starting solution from our heuristics um, to feed other solvers as well for the exact solvers. Um, and we've seen some promising results doing that, but we need some more, some more testing to see how that might work. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. What would be the hardware requirement for G-Wave to 
be more successful than your solution and to provide a custom advantage. I'm I didn't understand the question. I apologize. So what what would be the, the the hardware necessary to be more successful compared to uh, your solution? The D Wave or D Wave or D Wave? Yeah. Well, D Wave doesn't release what they're doing with their hybrid solver service, so I'm not sure what what they're doing. Um, with if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, they don't release the details now. It with that's the hybrid solver service, not the quantum only D wave solution. Did I answer that correctly? I don't know if I got the gist of the question. Yeah, maybe we have specialist of D wave architecture in the room. So if somebody wants to comment or no, no, no comments. They are not ready. Uh, I'm just kidding. Okay, some some other questions or comments? So if not, I, I have one one comment or one maybe I don't I don't know if it's a question. So what would be the timeline for the real quantum computer to beat uh, your solver? <laughs> <laughs> we need more qubits. I think every day it's it's exciting to read the news coming from the quantum community. Um, we're really leaps and bounds. Um, need to make some um, progress with error correction would be the, the main thing. And I think we're seeing that today. But I think we're closer. We used to say, well, we're 10 years away or we're we're five years away from actually using these. I think we may be actually closer to that than we believe or than we think. Um, and it could be within two to three years, we see real benefits for combinatorial optimization from, from quantum hardware, so. Okay, so. But, but at the same time, our, uh, at the conventional, Computing side, we're advancing as well, and um, at well, the present time, at the present time, we're pretty far ahead of the quantum world. Yeah, you know? and I think it's the combination of meta heuristics and quantum that, that, to me, is really exciting. It's what if we combine both of these together in hybrid solutions? Um, I think we can do some really amazing things. <laughs> Um, maybe a last question. Is there any uh, version available uh, of the solver for uh, testing? Not yet. We're going to be releasing a version as a service shortly. Um, so hopefully we'll have that available within the, the coming months. Okay. Questions again? So... I would like to thank you very much again for your presentation for this uh, appearance in the in the meeting. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.